explain what made me want to write a book about uh, Bella Gutman, the approach uh, I took, the journey I took to discover the truth about him, and maybe some, uh, a couple of other themes which I think the book threw up, and then maybe uh, if you have any questions at the end, that would be great. So if any of you have a developed knowledge about uh, football history, uh, you will have heard the name uh, Bella Gutman. He was the first of the superstar football coaches. So now we have the likes of uh, Jose Mourinho, uh, Pep Guardiola, Carlo Ancelotti. Uh, these guys who sell their talents to the highest bidder. They move from country to country, going from one uh, big club uh, to another. But it was Bella Gutman, really, who was the first to do that. Before Bella Gutman arrived on the scene, the coach in football, and it seems difficult to believe now, had been considered unimportant. It was the players that uh, achieved the success. The manager, the coach, was unimportant. So Gutman forged the path for the other coaches, later coaches, to follow. His greatest successes came in the 1950s, and in particular uh, the 1960s. Uh, the European Cup competition, uh, which is now known as the UEFA Champions League, was founded in 1955. And uh, at that point, only the top team, the champions from each country, would qualify for the European Cup. And the great Real Madrid team of the 1950s won the European Cup for the first five seasons. And it was Bella Gutman, uh, with Benfica of Lisbon, which broke the spell of Real Madrid and he won the European Cup as coach of Benfica in 1961 and 1962 beating Barcelona and Real Madrid uh, respectively. So Gutmann's willingness to, uh, to push for the best deal for himself led to arguably uh, what he's best known for, the incident that he's best known for and if you go on the internet this is liable to come up first when you look him up. Um, after the European Cup final in 1962, he said to the Benfica board of directors, uh, I want more money. This is the allegation that he said to them, I want more money. And they said to him, you're not having any more money. You've got to bear in mind that in 1962, the board of directors did not think the manager was so important, so they said, we don't want you anymore. We're not paying you any more money. So he said... I'm leaving, and not only am I leaving, but you, Benfica, will not win another European trophy for 100 years. <laughs> and since that time, uh, Benfica have appeared in eight European finals, <laughs> and they've lost every single one. Uh, and if any of you are good at maths, that is a probability based on an even chance of winning each match of one in 256. And this led to a very... Uh, Benfica are now completely obsessed by this curse. Uh, and in 1990, uh, Benf uh, Benfica were playing in a European Cup final. They qualified for the European Cup final uh, in Vienna, where Gutmann uh, was already buried. He died in 1981. And Eusebio, who's Benfica's greatest former player, uh, and somebody who... Gutmann actually discovered uh, in Mozambique in 1961, visited Gutmann's grave on the day of that match. And he knelt before the grave of Gutmann in the Jewish cemetery in Vienna. And he prayed to Gutmann to lift the curse. But Gutmann obviously refused, <laughs> and Benfica lost the match 1-0. So who was Bella Gutman? Bella Gutman was born in 1899, uh, the son of Abraham and Esther Gutman. And Abraham and Esther were part of the huge influx of Jews from the Hungarian provinces, from the east of Hungary, uh, to Budapest. And this was a community which, in the main, was extremely keen to be accepted uh, in Hungarian society. And they were incredibly successful 
in doing that. And some of the statistics are staggering. 60% of the lawyers and doctors in Budapest uh, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, 60% were Jews. 50% of journalists were Jews and a much higher percentage at the top newspapers. Uh, we often hear, uh, we often have it said uh, that Budapest and Prague and Vienna had a strong uh, Jewish influence. I think that's understating what Budapest was at that time. Budapest was to all intents and purposes a Jewish city, <coughs> so much so that anti-Semitic detractors throughout Europe would refer to Budapest as Judapest. What was to happen to the Jews of Hungary would have been unthinkable to them at the time of Gutmann's birth. And the terror started long before, long before the Shoah. Uh, from 1919 to 1921, there was the so-called White Terror, uh, where 3,000 Jews who had somehow survived, most of whom had somehow survived the First World War, First World War veterans, most of them, were massacred throughout Hungary. And Gutmann himself, he was a young player at this time, fled from Budapest to Novi Sad with his older brother Armin uh, to set up a dance school there. Uh, there were anti-Jewish laws uh, which started in Hungary in 1938 when Hungary was still an independent country. It wasn't occupied uh, by the Nazis until March 1944. And Gutmann lost his job despite having won the League and the Mitropa Cup, which was the precursor to the European Cup, the most prestigious club competition in Europe at that time. He lost his job despite that in 1939 because of anti-Jewish laws. And then, during the Holocaust, 600,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered, including between the 15th of May 1944 and the 8th of July 1944, a 54-day period in which 437,500 Jews were deported from Hungary almost all of whom went to Auschwitz at a rate of 8,000 a day, one Jew every 11 seconds. We don't, I think, need to be professional psychologists to guess what these terrible events emanating from this very secure environment, how these events shaped Bella Gutmann's character. And part of what makes the Gutmann story so captivating is his clearly defined personality which emerged, I believe, from these events. He was outspoken, he was distrustful, he was iconoclastic, innovative, and always, always, always arguing with authority, falling out with his bosses. So it was, this, it was the exciting football story, his contribution to the development of football, and, uh, and these great anecdotes with his very distinctive character to the fore, which initially got me interested in Bella Gutmann. But what I discovered soon after uh, I started the research was, was what got me really hooked. If you looked up the internet before my book came out, you, were, you would have discovered the following about Bella Gutmann's Holocaust experiences you would have read that he escaped to Switzerland. Firstly, you would have read, actually, that he managed, he went from Austria in 1938 to Hungary. Uh, he managed there from 1938 to 39, and then at some point he escaped to Switzerland, where he was interned. And it was there, it was alleged, that he met his wife. And he married his wife in 1942. And you will also have read that his brother Armin, who I mentioned, uh, uh, died in a concentration camp in Germany in January 1945. That's what you will have read. And every single last part of that 
is completely and utterly false. At the very earliest start of my research, I approached the Swiss authorities. Uh, they have a department which is uh, set aside, uh, part of a department set aside for uh, listing uh, the names of the Jewish interns that were in Switzerland uh, during the war. So I wrote to them, I said, uh, I'm researching this guy, his name's Bella Gutman, this is his date of birth, please give me the details when he arrived, when he left, etc., etc. And they replied to me and they sent me the database so I could look for myself. There was nobody here of that name, nobody of that date of birth, nobody of a similar name. So I smelt a rat. There was something, there was something going on here. And then I had a, a, a stroke of luck. Uh, I... I came across a Hungarian language interview uh, with Gutmann, uh, which was published after his death, but it was an interview shortly before his death in 1981, in which Gutmann tells the Hungarian journalist Tibor Hamari about his life experiences at length. And there was a paragraph in there in which he talks about his experience in a slave labour camp in the environs of Budapest, from which he says he escaped by jumping from a first floor window shortly before a planned uh, deportation and almost certain death. To make the story even more remarkable, he escaped together with another great football coach, Erno Egri Erbstein, who won the Italian league with Torino uh, after the war. So that was one story. And then, in 2015, an interview was published with a man called Pal Moldovani, a Hungarian now living in Germany, who is the nephew of Gutmann's wife, Marianne Moldova. And he describes how Gutmann met Marianne Moldovan, who was the, uh, a non-Jewish woman, a daughter of a uh, hairdresser uh, in the Oipes, uh, Re Oipes region, which is just right by Budapest. And in this interview, Paul Moldovani describes how his father, Paul Moldovan, who was the brother of Gutmann's wife, his then girlfriend during the war, hid Gutmann in the attic above his hairdressing salon, which he'd inherited from his own father. Then I, I wanted to know what happened to the rest of Gutmann's family. So I hired a Hungarian research company called Et Hachaim. I'd seen already on the uh, Yad Vashem database, when I was looking for what happened to Gutmann's family, I saw a long list of Gutmanns, uh, including the name Abraham Gutmann, which was Gutmann's father, who was born in 1866, so the date of birth matched, the name matched. But I thought... He couldn't be in Miskolch because the Gutmann family was in Budapest. And I had uh, confirmation that they were in Budapest in the early 1930s, so I dismissed that. But what this research company, Etz Chaim, discovered led me to the conclusion uh, that Abraham was actually deported from Miskolch. He was a 78-year-old widower at that time. Also murdered was Gutmann's sister, Sharon, aged 50, and other members of his extended family, including Irvin, the 14-year-old son of his brother, Armin. But Armin, the brother that was thought to have been murdered, the only member of the family that was thought to have been murdered, in fact, survived. <coughs> I managed to contact a man called, through a series of other contacts, Imre Gutman, who is Bella Gutman's nephew through his younger brother, uh, uh, his younger brother, Erno. And he filled in the missing parts of the jigsaw. And he told me that Armin actually survived from a labour camp. He went back to Miskolch and he married a non-Jewish woman. His first wife had been murdered, Irene. He went back to Miskolch. He hid his Jewish identity, but he is buried in the Jewish cemetery and the Miskolch Jewish community sent me a photo of his grave. 
So getting to the bottom of what happened to the Gutman family felt like a big triumph when so many, so many people, so many people had glossed over it or got it so, so wrong, which is interesting in itself, I believe, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If and when you read my book, uh, you will realise that this is not a conventional biography of a football manager. I've assumed no football knowledge whatsoever, and hopefully it will appeal to non-habitual football readers, but people also who are interested in Jewish and European history. It will be very clear to any readers of my book that the title, The Greatest Comeback, has a dual meaning. It primarily refers to Bella Gutman himself. In 1944, much of Europe wanted Bella Gutman dead because he was a Jew, and much of Europe succeeded in murdering most of his family and, his, uh, and the wider Jewish community of Central and Eastern Europe. Sixteen years later, Gutman lifted the most prestigious sporting trophy in that very same continent. That is the greatest comeback in football. But it struck me that the trajectory of Gutman's life largely traces that of the Jewish nation as a whole. And that broader story features throughout the book. If Gutman performed the greatest personal comeback in football history then the Jews of the 20th century performed the greatest national comeback in human history. I'll give you one parallel. When Gutmann was leading his team out uh, in the 1961 European Cup final, when Benfica were taking on Barcelona in May 1961, at that very, at that very time, at that very month, the reborn Jewish state of Israel was prosecuting Adolf Eichmann, uh, the principal architect of the Hungarian Holocaust, in a Jewish court uh, with Jewish judges in its ancient capital of Jerusalem. At this critical and very worrying juncture for Europe, I think my book also presents two contrasting visions of Europe, one of beauty, a wonder and romance represented by this great footballing competition, the European Cup, and also, of course, one of barbarism and genocide. There are some other key themes thrown up by my book. And one of them, for example, is the way Europe uh, played down or ignored the Holocaust in the post-war years. And this surely contributed to the ignorance uh, about what happened to Bella Gutmann. And a classic absurd example uh, is what I quote in my book. Uh, in the 1961, the World Soccer Magazine, which is the, a very prestigious upmarket football magazine, uh, did a profile of Bella Gutman. And the editor of the newspaper, one of the top journalists in Britain at that time, whose name was Eric Batty, ref uh, talked about Bella Gutman's history, and he said, quotes, Gutman lived in Hungary between 1938 and 1949 and left it at that omitting the rather pertinent fact that Gutmann was a Jew and 600,000 Hungarian Jews had been murdered during that period. The truth was actually out there if these journalists had wanted to use a mere fraction of their journalistic expertise and know-how to discover the truth. For example, there was a book published in South Africa in 1963, written by Arthur Goldman, who is the future president of the Maccabi Association in South Africa, in which he refers to Gutmann's time in a labour camp in Hungary. So the, the, the story about Gutmann was obviously there to be had, uh, and people were talking about it in Jewish circles, but the journalists didn't want to know. Gutmann, and, and perhaps many other survivors as well, <clears throat> instinctively understood Europe's reluctance to come to terms with the Holocaust and recognise the uniqueness and enormity uh, of the Holocaust. 
in his 80,000 word uh, biograph autobiography, which was published in 1964, uh, he, wrote, he wrote the following. In the last 15 years, countless books have been written about the destructive years <coughs> of struggle for life and death. It would thus be superfluous to trouble my readers with such details. I suffered and endured no more or less than many millions of my European contemporaries. The word Jew did not appear in the entire book of 80,000 words. He didn't mention also the Jewish teams he played for. There was one mention of a team called the Hakoach All-Stars, which was a team in New York, but he referred to them as the All-Stars, omitting the offending Hebrew prefix. <laughs> Gutman was an ambitious person seeking to make, make, uh, make his way in post-war Europe. And his readership, let us not forget, were mainly Austrian and German men in 1964 of a certain generation, people who had killed Jews themselves, witnessed with great enthusiasm other Jews, be, uh, Jews being killed, or did nothing about it. And Gutmann knew instinctively this was a subject he should not broach. Of course, Europe does now acknowledge uh, the Holocaust more openly than it used to, but I still think it presents the Holocaust in a rather in disingenuous way in order to preserve Europe's image and reputation. This is a form of what Deborah Lipstadt, uh, the Jewish historian, would refer to as softcore denial, as opposed to hardcore denial, which is denying the Holocaust happened at all. And there are two main methods this soft core denial manifests itself. Firstly, we're always told that it was the Nazis who carried out the Holocaust. The Nazis carried out the Holocaust. And we're often given the phrase, the Nazi Holocaust. And therefore, neglecting uh, millions of eager or compliant participants in Europe. The second main method of soft-core soft denial is to present the Holocaust as a terrible blip, something, a terrible period, which we must never let happen again, and therefore downplaying the fact that Jews have been murdered, expelled, tortured on an extremely consistent basis in virtually every country in Europe for many centuries. I've sought in the book to highlight this terrible truth, not that I needed much help, because faithfully, faithfully recording uh, Gutmann's life would have done the job anyway. Gutmann lived in 14 countries, and many of those populations and governments enthusiastically participated in the, Holocaust, in the Holocaust or were glad to see the back of the Jews or just simply turned a blind eye. Anti-Semitism, of course, accounted for his terrible suffering in the war and, of course, his, the murder of his family during the Holocaust. But as I've already indicated, there was a lot more anti-Semitism that he faced apart from the Holocaust. I've already talked about the white terror in 1920. I've already talked about the anti-Jewish laws in 1939. But there was also much more. As I will go into, uh, the Zionist team that he played for in the 1920s, Hakoach Vienna, the great Hakoach Vienna, suffered the most appalling abuse, as did their fans. And after surviving the Holocaust, Gutmann returned to a Central and Eastern Europe where up to 2,000 Jews in the immediate aftermath of the war uh, were massacred in widespread pogroms. In 1949, uh, Gutmann fled or escaped from communist Hungary. Communist Hungary, the Soviet uh, satellite states at that time, were prosecuting and even executing uh, Jews throughout the region for the, ale for the alleged crime of Zionism. In 1964, 
when Gutmann was a twice European Cup winning coach by this stage. He was manager of the Austrian national team and he resigned in 1964. His only time on record where he decries anti-Semitism and he said, I cannot stand it anymore, I'm resigning, there's too much anti-Semitism in the media, in the footballing establishment and among the players. The nickname for Gutmann among the players and the media was Wunder Rabbina, the Wonder Rabbi. And this list, and there's more, this list excludes the continual carping and innuendo about his alleged money grabbing. He was always being referred to in the European press as greedy because he wanted more money and why shouldn't he? He was right at the top of his game. Uh, and one place where he definitely did suffer from this continual carping was Portugal, a uh, scene of his greatest glory, where in other respects the anti-Jewish agitation was not so prominent, possibly because that particular country had murdered, expelled and forcibly converted its own Jews 500 years before. Another sub-story in the book is the huge role, the huge role of Jews particularly Central European Jews, in football before the Holocaust. I knew something about this, but the extent was an absolute revelation to me and became more so the more I dug into the research. When Gutmann made his debut for an excellent Hungarian, Hungarian national team in 1921 in a match where Hungary beat Germany 3-0, there were six Jews in the starting 11. And let us not forget, that game was played in the midst of the White Terror. So despite this persecution that was going on of Jews throughout the country, Hungarian football needed its Jews. Almost all of the teams that Gutmann played for throughout his very successful footballing career were Jewish teams in Austria, in Hungary, and the United States. It was quite possible as Gutmann proved, for a top player to play all his career playing for Jewish clubs. His first major club was MTK Budapest, which was formed in 1888 and was the top Hungarian side of that era. And in the first three decades of the 20th century, more than 50% of MTK's players were Jews. Most of their supporters, if not all their supporters, were Jews. It was known as the Jewish club. Even now, MTK is still going. They get crowds of about 1,500, 2,000. Apparently, they're still mostly Jews, and they suffer vicious racist abuse on a very regular basis. The team was hugely successful in Hungary at that time, and Gutmann won the league with them, and they won the league nine times between 1917 and 1925. The non-Jewish population regarded MTK as Jews, but MTK themselves were very, very keen to play down their Jewish roots. And that reflected the aspirations of Hungarian Jewry in general to assimilate within Hungarian society. Even their name indicated that. MTK stands for Hungarian words uh, which mean the circle of Hungarian fitness activists. And they even changed their name at one point to Hungaria to prove how Hungarian they were as opposed to Jewish. But nobody really was listening. Other Jewish clubs that he played for had a much more forceful uh, Jewish nationalistic tinge to them. Uh, for example, the greatest example, of course, is Hakoach Vienna. So few people know about this story. I believe this is the most captivating heroic and tragic story of any football team in the history of football, let alone a Jewish one. Uh, Hakkar Vienna was not just a Jewish football club in the sense that many other football clubs were Jewish because they'd been founded by Jews and they had many Jewish supporters like, for example, Bayern Munich uh, or Ajax of Amsterdam. The Jewish ethos went to its very core. They wore the blue and white for every match of the Jewish national movement. They wore a big Magain David on their, on their 
on, on their shirts. They used to sing the Hatikva, the song of the, the anthem of the Jewish national movement for every single match. And by the way, I'll just stress again that Austria, just like Hungary, was not a footballing backwater. Austria and Hungary were the two principal powers, along, probably along with Italy, in the interwar period. Austria reached the World Cup semi-final, Hungary reached the World Cup final in, 19, in 1938. And Gutmann won the Austrian league, an incredible story, with Hakkawak Vienna. Despite all this hatred they, they incurred, they won the Austrian league in 1925 with Gutmann as the centre-half and fulcrum of this team. And they were heroes. Hakkawak Vienna were heroes throughout the Jewish world. And as a result of their popularity, uh, and in order to raise funds for the club, they would travel uh, throughout, throughout the world. And they were incredibly popular. And some of the news stories I read were quite uh, uh, mind-boggling. When they went to uh, Warsaw, for example, in 1925, on a pre-season tour, 10,000 people arrived at the train station just to meet them off the train. 10,000 people. And a similar amount uh, uh, went to Tel Aviv train station to welcome them in Palestine in 1924, uh, where they were welcomed by Mayor Dizengoff, the, uh, the mayor of Tel Aviv. They went to Poland, and they beat uh, Polonia, who were Poland's finest, uh, finest uh, team at that time. And this provoked riots and civil disturbances and their next game had to be, they had to play under very heavy guard. They went to the United States in uh, 1926, and they smashed the record for a football in t attendance, a record which then stood for 50 years, uh, and overall in nine matches, or ten matches, they attracted more than a quarter of a million spectators to their games. They came to London, uh, and they played West Ham United in 1923. West Ham United had just won the FA Cup, the most prestigious tournament in English football. Hakkawak Vienna wiped the floor with them, massacred them, beat them 5-0. But just as they were worshipped by the Jews, they were despised by so many others. They suffered from a torrent of racial abuse, verbal and physical assault on the pitch and their fans off the pitch. Football commentators now like to uh, make a big thing of the rivalry, the hatred even, between Arsenal and Tottenham Hotspur or between Manchester United and Liverpool or Barcelona and Real Madrid. But compared to what Hakkawak Vienna had to go through, this was all child's play. We have to remember that most of Hakkawak Vienna supporters were to be murdered within a matter of years. In March 1938, with the Anschluss, when the Nazis marched into Vienna, Hakkawak Vienna's ground was shut down, its ground was taken over by the Nazis, and its results were annulled from the history books. Gutmann, by the way, was the last coach of Hakkawak Vienna uh, before the Shoah. Great uh, innovators of strategy and tactics Jewish coaches were absolutely everywhere uh, throughout Europe. The first time Real Madrid won their domestic league, the coach was a Jew. The first time Bayern Munich won their domestic league, the coach was a Jew. The first time Benfica won their domestic league, the coach was a Jew. And it wasn't Bela Gutmann, another Jew, Lippo Herzka, had got there before him. The most successful coach of the great Italian league of the 1930s was a Jew. Arpad Weiss won the league Italian League three times with Inter Milan and Bologna before being murdered at Auschwitz in 1944 with his wife and two young children. These Jewish figures, many of whom, all of whom, had a relationship of some sort with Bella Gutmann, feature throughout my book. This history is fascinating, but also, I believe, so terribly tragic. Here I am, a Jew with a passion for football from as long as I can remember, with a fascination for Jewish history which dates back to my, certainly my early adult years, knew nothing about this. 
Jewish contribution to football. Not even that much about the greatest Jew in the history of football, Bella Goodman. It became clear to me that the Holocaust didn't just account for the murder of six million Jews, but also devastated Jewish collective memory to the extent that we don't actually really know who we were. The devastation of Jewish memory is one reason why we're so ignorant about the Jewish contribution to football. But I think there are other reasons too. 90% of the world's Jews now live in Israel or the United States. And soccer is now a foreign sport in the United States, although it's having some sort of re revival. And it's a long time since Hakoach attracted such passion amongst the Jews of New York in particular. And so they're more interested, American Jews, in the exploits of American Jews in sport. The baseball players like Sandy Koufax and Han Greenberg or Mark Spitz the swimmer. The newly established State of Israel was, I think, more interested in establishing its own narrative, its own identity and folklore to concentrate too much on the exploits of diaspora Jews. In the UK, in Britain, the very limited exploits of Jewish footballers, certainly in comparison to uh, what was achieved in Central Europe, um, has been used in a bid to prove how British we allegedly are. Hey, look at us. We play football. We watch football. We're just like you, aren't we? In 2014, uh, the Jewish Museum held an exhibition, uh, and it was called 4-4 Jew. And it promised to tell, quote, the untold story of Jews and football. And it made a big play of Mark Lazarus, uh, uh, a decent but journeyman Jewish footballer who scored the winning goal for Queen's Park Rangers in the... League Cup final of 1967. It also made a play of Jewish executives in football like David Dean, the former vice chairman of Arsenal. But where was Bella Gutman? Where was Hakoach Vienna? Where were the other great Jewish clubs and Zionist clubs of Central and Eastern Europe? Where was Arpad Weiss, the champion of Italy? Where was Lipot Herzka, who won the league with Real Madrid and Benfica? Where was Hugo Meisel, a man who managed the, Aust the great Austrian team of the 1920s and 1930s, a man who revolutionised uh, football uh, tactics, who brought, uh, brought Austria to the World Cup semi-final in 1934, who co-founded the World Cup competition, Hugo Meisel. Where was Imre Herschel, uh, the Hungarian Jew who won the league with the great River Plate of Argentina and the great Penarol of Uruguay, Uruguay? Where was Richard Kahn, the coach of Barcelona and Bayern Munich before the war? Where was Erno Erbstein, the man who escaped from the labour camp with Bella Gutmann, who won the league with Torino twice in the late 1940s before being killed in a tragic air crash, an incredible story. And there were so many others, many of whom are detailed in my book. The story promised by the Jewish Museum remained untold. The lack of interest, or I would say possibly even snobbishness, among Jewish historians is another reason why uh, football, the exploits of these great Jewish football people are not so well known. Why, no, why they don't trip off the tongue, these names, why they don't trip off the tongue of anybody, any Jewish football fan, or for that matter, any Jew or any person who claims to have a good knowledge of modern uh, general Jewish history. The Encyclopedia Judaica uh, was first published in the early 1970s. And don't forget, this was only 10 years after Bella Gutman had lifted 
the most prestigious sporting competition in Europe uh, and probably one of the two or three most prestigious in the world. The Encyclopedia Judaica is a very comprehensive resource and it detailed 25,000 articles on a whole range of subjects and personalities. But Bella Gutmann and Hankoach Vienna were only given very passing mentions in a general article about, about sport. Uh, neither was given an individual article uh, all to themselves, but that was an honour which was nevertheless accorded to Gutmann's namesakes, Michael Gutmann, a Talmudic scholar from the Hungarian provinces, and Robert Gutmann, an artist from Prague. It may not be top of the list when it comes to remembering the Jewish communities of Europe, but the stories of the passion, the fervour, and the pandemonium which Hakoach Vienna caused throughout Central and Eastern Europe prove how popular, what a passion football was for many Jews who were murdered. And if my book achieves anything, I would like it to lift or reduce some of that tragic ignorance about the huge influence of Jews on the world's most popular sport. And right, like just to show you at the end, before we take any questions, a few photos which maybe bring to life a bit more of what I'm talking about. Um, this is a photo, the earliest photo of Bella Goodman, with his father Abraham and his brother Armin. Uh, Bella is on the left. Uh, Armin as a, uh, played with Bella at Bella's first club, Torekves, in uh, Budapest. Uh, also playing for that team was Arpad Weiss, who I mentioned was murdered at Auschwitz, having won the Italian League. Also played in the same team. Uh, it was a mostly Jewish team, as were many teams in Hungary at that time. Abraham, as I have mentioned, got to 78. His wife had already died in 1941 of natural causes. Abraham was murdered in 1944. Uh, Armin survived the war uh, when everyone thought He'd actually been murdered. He wasn't. This is a photo of the great Hakart Vienna team as they get ready for action before a game. Bella is just tying his bootlaces there on, on the left. You can see there with a the big Star of David there. Uh, so proud. This is another picture of Hakart Vienna. I love all these photos. Uh, this is the flag they used to bring out onto the pitch before every game. This is a photo of a house in Budapest, which belonged to a Jewish industrialist called Lipot Ashner. And Lipot Ashner was Bella Gutmann's boss at the club Oipest. Lipot Ashner was also something of a hero. Uh, when the anti-Jewish laws came in in Hungary, uh, the Hungarians said that the, you can only employ, every enterprise can only employ 6% I think it was Jews. And uh, Lipot Ashton in his factory had more than 6%. He was Jewish himself. He had more than 6%. So what he did was, rather than consign Jews to poverty, he just employed a lot of non-Jews. So the Jews would remain at 6% or go down to 6%. On March the 19th, 1944, Lipot Ashner, aged then 72, on the day of the Nazi invasion, was evicted from his house. The reason was is because Adolf Eichmann was driving round Budapest looking for a house in which he could live, uh, a Jewish house so he could throw the Jew out, and it was in these very rooms from that veranda where Eichmann maybe took a morning coffee before he planned the murder of several thousand more Jews on that day. Uh, there is no marking of that house, either that it was Ashner's house all that it was Eichmann's house. We managed to get into the back garden, the offices, and there's a gym on the ground floor. There's no marking whatsoever. This is the hero uh, of my book, in a way. This is Paul Moldovan, uh, Gutmann's brother in law, the hairdresser. Uh, he hid Gutmann uh, in his attic above his hairdressing salon in 1944 in Oipest. 
when Jews uh, across the street and around the corner in the ghetto were being marched off to their deaths in their thousands. Uh, he was rewarded for his incredible courage by the communist authorities by having his hairdressing salon taken away from him by the, the communist authorities and he managed to escape from Hungary in 1957 and he died in Germany in 1975. This is Bella with his wife uh, Marianne in their, in their prime. Uh, one of the great fascinating things about Bella <laughs> you said with a great Hungarian accent as well. Uh, uh, um, one of the great things about Bella Goodman is through his life he, he, he came into contact either playing, managing, playing with or against the great figures of 20th century uh, football. Uh, George Best finished his career, Goodman's career, when Manchester United massacred Benfica in 1966. Uh, Pele uh, played against uh, Goodman a couple of times in 1957. And this is another, another story. This is Pushkas on the uh, right-hand side, Ferenc Pushkas and Sandor Kosic. Uh, in, the, in the middle, two great uh, uh, Hungarian uh, players. And Gutmann managed Honved in 1956. Honved were outside Hungary playing in a European Cup match, match when the Hungarian Revolution happened. And they, the players refused to go back and they went on a world tour uh, instead. And Gutmann uh, managed them during this world tour. Uh, and here's another picture of Gutmann with another great player. This is the man who he discovered. Eusebio, uh, who uh, scored, a, uh, scored a two goals in the European Cup final in 1962 and also prayed before Gutmann's grave uh, in 1990, asking him to lift the curse. Uh, here's another great photo of Gutmann uh, having won the league with Porto in 1959. This is a photo of Gutmann uh, giving uh, a lecture to his Austrian players uh, as I say, he resigned from that position within a matter of month, months, citing intolerable anti-Semitism from the players. Uh, this is Gutmann holding uh, the great European Cup with uh, uh, Eusebio on the left, another great player, uh, Mario Kaluna. Okay, that is, that is it. Thank you. Thank you.